Hello and welcome to Triage, timely conversations for healthcare professionals, a podcast created and produced by KNL Gates. Each episode is designed to highlight important developments in health law and analyze the impact on our clients and friends of the firm. We hope you enjoy this podcast. Hi, my name is Gina Bertolini. I'm a partner in the Kano Gates Healthcare and FDA Practice Group in Research Triangle Park. And I'm Stephen Page, and I'm a partner in the FDA and Healthcare Regulatory Practice Group in Nashville, Tennessee. Stephen and I frequently practice in the areas of healthcare data privacy and security, including HIPAA, and we answer a lot of questions related to electronic health records and health IT. And especially over the last couple of years since the passage of the information blocking rule, a particular focus for my practice has been the information blocking rule. And that is the subject of today's triage episode. In May of 2020, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT, which is known as ONC, published the information blocking rule. And just as we get started in our conversation today, I'll just give a little bit of background on the information blocking rule. It became effective in April of 2021. There had been one extension. It initially would have been effective in November of 2020, but due to the COVID pandemic and a number of other factors, ONC extended that initial deadline. And the information blocking rule generally prohibits interference with the permissible access, use, or exchange of electronic health information, or EHI, as you'll hear us talk about it today. And the exceptions to that would be where the interference is required by law or where an information blocking exception applies. So in other words, the information blocking rule says actors who are subject to the rule cannot interfere with permissible access use exchange of EHI unless, for example, there's a state law that would prohibit disclosure of the EHI or if there's an information blocking exception. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Actors who are subject to the information blocking rule are healthcare providers, health IT developers, and health information exchanges and networks. And there are eight exceptions. But one thing that's important about the exceptions is whether a practice would constitute information blocking really is a facts and circumstances analysis. So much like the anti-kickback statute safe harbors, um, which are facts and circumstances analyses, if you don't squarely fit into an information blocking exception, it doesn't necessarily mean that your practice would be considered Uh, in interference or or information blocking, you would need to go through the analysis and look at all the facts and circumstances. So, Gina, the initial deadline was April of 2021, but another major milestone just occurred on October 6th, 2022. And I understand the last few weeks especially have been a busy time in the world of information blocking. Can you tell us what's been going on? Yes, absolutely. There's been a lot happening over the last couple of weeks. Um, So the definition of electronic health information initially consisted of only the data elements represented in the IT standard that's known as United States Core Data for Interoperability. It's kind of a mouthful, um, and it's abbreviated as USCDI. And USCDI consists of 16 data classes, each with various data elements. So just as an example, Clinical notes is one of the data classes, and then there are eight data elements under clinical notes, um, different different aspects of clinical notes, um, such as progress notes. And so the, the information blocking prohibition on practices that interfere with access exchange or use of EHI, it pertained to this universe of data, the data elements that rep- were represented in the USCDI data standard. And that definition really represented a compromise by ONC, and it allowed affected actors um, who were subject to the information blocking rule to just gradually prepare for information blocking requirements. So a lot of the feedback that ONC received when the proposed rule was pending and interested parties could comment is that this, this would be a really significant change for actors, and they would need time to ramp up to um, be able to comply with the information blocking rule. And so that definition of EHI was somewhat of a compromise and it sunsetted on October 6th of 2022. And as of that date, the definition of EHI is all electronic protected health information or PHI within the designated record set. And our listeners who you know, are healthcare providers or otherwise operating within this world will recognize those terms. The terms PHI or protected health information and designated record set 
are defined by HIPAA's regulatory requirements. And because we're still seeing a lot of confusion, we're hearing about a lot of confusion among stakeholders about the definition of EHI and what it means in relation to information blocking, we are dedicating this episode of triage to providing some context and clarity on the issue. Yeah, and, and you're right. We've received a number of questions from clients over the past several months about how to interpret and apply the information blocking rule. But just a few weeks ago before the October 6th deadline, there was a letter submitted to HHS about delaying the deadline. Can you tell us about that? Sure, I will. And, and one of the reasons we want to focus on that today is that I think it illustrates well some of the confusion and the lack of clarity that exists within the stakeholder community. So on September 26, a group of 10 organizations, including one known as CHIME, which is the College of Health, Health Information Management Executives, and nine other organizations that represent a broad range of providers across the healthcare continuum and across the nation, submitted a letter to Secretary Becerra, who's Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And in the letter, the organizations essentially requested an extension of all information blocking deadlines, including the October 6th deadline. The letter also requested an implementation of corrective action warning letters that would be issued to healthcare providers prior to a government agency beginning an information blocking investigation or um, applying disincentives, which would be the penalties in the event of a violation of the information blocking rule. And the letter, it essentially indicated that the healthcare provider community, despite diligent efforts to comply with information blocking deadlines, have not had the resources, and in particular, the IT resources to adequ adequately prepare. Um, and it makes the point that this is particularly true for rural providers who are relying heavily on health IT vendors and also that health IT vendors readiness is lagging. That was actually the term used from the letter, lagging. Um, and the organizations in their letter stated that despite their best efforts to educate their members who are largely the healthcare providers and HIM management professionals, that significant knowledge gaps and confusion still exists within the provider and the vendor communities about implementation of, of information blocking regulations. Right. And so, so as background, the information blocking final rule was published in May of 2020, and the prohibition on information blocking was effective April of 2021. So why do we think there's still so much confusion out there? Yes, Stephen, that's a great question. It's clear there's still a lot of confusion within the stakeholder community. And, you know, we've been hearing it from our clients. And this letter actually, I think, does a really good job of summarizing the primary points and the, the concerns that we've been hearing. So I'll briefly summarize the points that were raised in the letter, and then we can address the issues that are raised by those points. So there were four primary points that the professional organizations made that support their request to delay the information blocking rule deadlines. Those points are as follows. First, the letter alleges that there is no clear definition of EHI, and there are, quote, widely divergent approaches, end quote, to how stakeholder organizations are interpreting the key terms, which is electronic PHI, designated record set, and EHI. Second, the letter argues that there's a lack of technical infrastructure that supports the secure exchange of EHI. And further, that health IT vendors are not required to meet technical standard updates like um, API standards and EHI export until 2023. And the letter goes on to say that because these requirements do not align with provider requirements related to information blocking, that there is confusion among the provider community. The third point is that there is insufficient guidance to assist providers in protecting sensitive health records. So things like substance use disorder records, um, my, records related to minors, mental health records, and reproductive health information. And fourth, that there's significant confusion on how the eight information blocking exceptions are applied, which would affect when EHI cannot or should not be exchanged. And in particular, the letter makes the point that providers are concerned about harm when lab results related to life-threatening diagnoses are released. So for the sake of time, Stephen, we won't address all of the points in depth. We will particularly highlight the first two points 
related to the disparate definitions and the health IT standards, because I think that really goes to the heart of the confusion among the stakeholder community. But we will touch upon the other points that were raised. And, you know, again, well, what I've said is I think the latter really is reflective of stakeholder sentiment and confusion around the definition of EHI. I do think that we can provide clarity on these issues that will help healthcare providers better understand the scope of the information blocking rule and how they can come into compliance. Okay. Well, let's start with the definition of EHI. Uh, Some of these terms, EPHI and designated record set, are terms that have existed under HIPAA's privacy rule and have been around for a really long time. Yes, that's right. Those terms have been around for a long time, and that's a fundamental issue that I think there is a lot of confusion over. Um, So it's an important issue to address. Just as a reminder, not that um, our listeners will need to be reminded, but to sort of lay the groundwork, healthcare providers have been complying with HIPAA's privacy rule for decades. Um, And that privacy rule includes a private right of access to PHI. Now, under HIPAA, PHI is defined as individually identifiable health information that's transmitted or maintained in electronic media. And there are a few exceptions, such as educational records. And then HIPAA's right of access, which, again, gives individuals the right to access their PHI, applies to PHI that is contained within a designated record set. And there are a few exceptions to that, specifically psychotherapy notes and information compiled in relation to litigation are carved out and would not be considered PHI for the right of access right. So a deep dive on how designated record set is defined is not something that we have time for today. But for purposes of this discussion, what is important is that designated record set is a functional definition and each covered entity defines for itself what its designated record set is. These are concepts that healthcare providers have been working with for decades and you know, have policies and departments in place and processes in place to address these kinds of concepts and these requests. So when a patient requests their medical records under HIPAA's right of access, the covered entity responds by providing the PHI that is contained within the designated record set. And of course, the response would be dependent on the scope of the request. So in terms of the dates of the records requested and whether the requester seeks all records or only certain components of the record. EPHI, which is how the term is used under HIPAA, is electronic PHI. Okay, okay. So exactly how does EHI relate to EPHI and the designated record sets under HIPAA? Well, under the information blocking rule, EHI is electronic PHI, as that term is defined under HIPAA, that is included within the designated record set, also as that term is defined under HIPAA. So the records that are subject to the information blocking rules requirements are electronic PHI, and that's what providers have been disclosing through HIPAA's right of access for decades. I think where the confusion lies, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, so I I ask our listeners, you know, to hang in there with us. I think where the confusion lies is that healthcare providers believe there are technical requirements inherent in the information blocking rule. ONC has made clear that there are not technical requirements imposed under the information blocking rule. In other words, the information blocking rule does not require healthcare providers to adopt technology. And in fact, in one of ONC's webinar, Mike Lipinski, who is the Director of Regulatory and Policy Affairs at ONC and has done a lot of the webinars that are available through ONC's website at healthit.gov, specifically reiterates the point. And Mr. Lipinski in that webinar said, we're not asking anybody to adopt technology. ONC has also made the point that there's not a proactive requirement to make EHI available. And in one of its FAQs, also available on the website, ONC specifically said that proactively or proactive are not terms or regulatory concepts that are included within the information blocking regulations. The question is, once a request for EHI has been made, how do healthcare providers react? And the answer is 
that they need to provide EHI in the means requested if they have the technological capability to do so. And taking steps to delay or interfere with an otherwise permissible exchange of PHI when the technical capability exists could be considered information blocking, absent an exception or a law that would um, impose the, the duty to not disclose information. Um, but so there is, there is no technical requirement imposed by the information blocking rule, but if you have the technical capability, then you should not interfere with the access use or, dis or exchange of EHI. Stephen, compounding this confusion, I think, is that providers are conflating CMS's promoting interoperability standards with information blocking requirements. So let's talk for a minute about the Promoting Interoperability Program. That's formerly known as Meaningful Use, and that's how a lot of providers might refer to the program since passage of the Affordable Care Act, Meaningful Use. It's now known as the Promoting Interoperability Program, and it's a voluntary program through CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that prioritizes interoperability and the exchange of healthcare data. So that is the underlying policy, right, is to enhance the interoperability of healthcare data. Although the information blocking rule does not generally require the voluntary or automatic release of EHI, healthcare providers that participate in the promoting interoperability program must comply with certain measures, including one that is now called provide patients electronic access to their health information. <laughs> and it is, the measure is just what it sounds like. It requires healthcare providers participating in the Promoting Interoperability Program to allow patients to view, download, and transmit their health information electronically, for example, through a patient portal. So those patient portal requirements are not information blocking requirements per se. In other words, the patient portals are not the result of the information blocking rule, right? The patient portals are, it's a mechanism that um, healthcare providers are using to meet a promoting interoperability measure or multiple promoting interoperability measures. Now, the way the promoting interoperability program ties back to ONC requirements is that the technology that is required to meet the promoting interoperability program measures requires the use of Certified Electronic Health Record Technology, or CEHRT. Certified Electronic Health Record Technology is governed by ONC regulations, which were, by the way, updated in May of 2020 as part of ONC's final rule. But that final rule implemented not only the information blocking rule, which we know is at 45 CFR Part 171, but also implemented HIT standard updates and technical specifications and establish certain certification criteria. Those health IT standards are located at 45 CFR Part 170. So those health IT standards are not part of the information blocking rule requirements. And I think that's where some of the confusion lies. Okay, so let me make sure I've got this. So EHI describes the electronic PHI that a healthcare provider maintains in its designated record set. And that is what healthcare providers need to make available in response to a request. And then the information blocking rule does not require the adoption of certain technology. So how is it that the information blocking rule is different than HIPAA's individual right of access? Well, in part, it's different because it prohibits practices that interfere with access use or exchange of EHI that applies not only to healthcare providers, but also health IT developers and health information exchanges and networks. And that's different. But it's also different because it allows a requester to obtain the information electronically in the means requested, unless an exception applies. That's the interoperability aspect of the rule. So requesters who have a lawful purpose for accessing EHI should be able to do so electronically and that, of course, enhances the utility of the information. And again, that's the underlying policy around interoperability and transparency. And this is where the eight exceptions become relevant. So there may be an exception that applies to a request for EHI. An example would be where complying with a request is infeasible under the circumstances, and you take into consideration a number of factors, including the EHI that's been requested, 
the cost of complying with the request and the resources that are available. And that's called the infeasibility exception. Another example of where the infeasibility exception may be relevant directly addresses actually one of the points that the CHIME letter made, which is the difficulty around accessing sensitive records. So records of minors, for example, many of which are subject to specific state law requirements and substance use disorder records. And a lot of our listeners will understand that um, me, uh, many substance use disorder records, depending on, on how they're formed and um, the healthcare providers that originate those records, are subject to a federal law related to the confidentiality of substance use disorder records. It's a heightened law, and it's more restrictive than HIPAA's privacy rule. So the infeasibility exception might apply where EHI that is subject to these heightened restrictions that I just mentioned cannot be segmented in a way that would allow the healthcare provider to comply with the law and also disclose the information that's been requested. So, Gina, if, if our listeners are keeping track of the four points that you made when summarizing the letter, I think we've just covered three of those four points. Is that right? That's right. So, in short, healthcare providers should rely on the fact that they've been navigating the definitions of EPHI and designated record set for a couple of decades. And it is true that what constitutes a designated record set is going to be specific to the healthcare provider. So there will be some nuances for each health system of what may or may not be included within a designated record set, but that is a regulatory definition that guides healthcare providers in making that assessment. So while there may be some variability across health systems, just depending on the business and the patients and the type of records that are maintained, there won't be such extreme variability as to make it difficult or impossible for providers to comply with the information blocking rule or for patients to understand what information they will receive when they make a request. Um, with regard to the health IT standards and the certain technical requirements that roll out in 2022 and 2023, that was another point in the letter, healthcare providers are not expected to respond to requests for EHI with technology that they don't have. And the information blocking rule itself does not require the adoption of certain technology. But if you have the technology, you need to use it. And if you do use it, that is where the exceptions become relevant to ensure that an actor is not information blocking. And an another quick point I'll add is that, as I mentioned earlier, information blocking is a facts and circumstances analysis. So even if you don't fall into the exception, one of the eight exceptions, you still may not be considered an information blocker, just depending on the circumstances. We talked briefly about sensitive records, and based on my work with healthcare providers, I also agree that technology solutions are lacking to effectively segment or otherwise ensure that sensitive records are treated um, in a manner that's always compliant with heightened state or federal law protections. But again, there are exceptions that may apply, such as um, practices that interfere with access or exchange but are required by law, which would not be considered information blocking, as well as some of the exceptions that I've mentioned, privacy and infeasibility, to name a few. Okay, so what about the last point regarding provider concern regarding the release of lab results for life-threatening conditions? Can you talk a little bit more about that point? I can, and I can I can talk a lot more about that, Stephen. So I'll try to keep it I'll try to keep it limited. This is really a drum that providers and ONC have been beating for a long time, and you know, even predating the final rule and the proposed rule, um, there was a lot of talk about this, and there's also a lot of guidance on it, um, even since the the promulgation of the the final rule. So ONC has really made clear that patient protectionism should not interfere with the exchange of EHI unless, of course, you know, other laws such as more restrictive state laws apply. And it's worth mentioning there are some states that have laws that pertain specifically to the release of lab results and how those lab results can be disclosed and whether, you know, a conversation with a patient needs to occur before that disclosure. So if there is a more restrictive state law, healthcare providers would follow that more restrictive state law. But um, in the absence of that, th then they would they would not take steps to interfere with the um, immediate release of this information. Um, there is a lot of discourse about this in the provider com uh, community. You know, we've talked a lot with our clients about it, um, both the clinical, legal, and, co and also compliance teams. Um, and I think what experience and studies are showing is that patients do respond well to having information available immediately, allowing them to review it and digest it on their own terms, maybe with family or loved ones around them, 
allowing them to then formulate their thoughts and questions so that when they actually do have a conversation with their healthcare providers, both patient and provider are better able to focus on the clinical aspects of the diagnosis or the test results and what might come next for the patient. So in response to the CHIME letter, ONC did not extend its deadline related to the definition of EHI did it. That's right. It did not. That deadline occurred October 6th. ONC did release a health IT buzz blog post on September 30th, and it's called Information Blocking Eight Regulatory Reminders for October 6th. So when we saw that on September 30th, we were, and that was, of course, issued after the CHIME letter, um, we were fairly certain that ONC was not going to extend the deadline. And just for our listeners' awareness, our Kane Gates Health Law Practice Group has been providing advice on this issue and working directly with healthcare providers and HIT developers since really the information blocking rule was published in um, mid-2020. And we are happy to provide assistance if our listeners have questions or need additional guidance. Well, Gina, thanks for walking us through that. This was very helpful. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Triage. Stay tuned for more episodes and please feel free to contact us directly if we can provide assistance or support to you. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Triage, timely conversations for healthcare professionals. New episodes are available for download through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. By subscribing to Triage, you will receive timely notifications for each new episode. Also, if you have any topics you would like to hear discussed on Triage, please don't hesitate to email triagesupport at klgates.com. We would love to hear from you.